Afternoon everyone. First of all, just to say welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for taking time to join. Today we're here to announce the launch of a new pilot scholarship initiative initiated and led by a group of current and ex-senior international players supported by us, the FAI, the League of Ireland and the PFAA, PFAI. First and foremost, we would like to show our thanks and appreciation to the group of players who have already shown great leadership to, in developing this concept. We believe the players deserve great credit for wanting to give back and be involved in the development structures of Irish, the Irish game, both for boys and girls. We as the FAI are delighted to su support this pilot programme and we look forward to working with the players, the League of Ireland, the League of Ireland clubs and the PFAI to create the best possible programme possible. Producing more and better Irish developed players will be a, an overall key aim for us in the creation of the Football Pathways Plan, which we plan to launch later this year. And to achieve that, we need to look at the holistic development players, both supporting players in their football development, personal development and academic development. This programme will be a great trial for some of the initiatives that will form part of the wider integration of football and education throughout the pathway, both football and education. And we see this as one of the biggest opportunities for football development across the country. As we move forward, the new football pathways plan and when it's introduced will be crucial to have the experience and support of players and other key stakeholders to create that real change. Just a few bits of background before we open up for questions. As you'll know, when the COVID pandemic hit, a group of players, Gavin, James, Seamus, Ender Stephen, and another other players raised a figure in excess of 30,000 euros to support and fund League of Ireland players that were going through difficulties in that period of time. Due to the leadership and management of clubs displayed during that period of time, money remains from the fund and the players have agreed to use that money for a pilot scholarship initiative, which is a really positive thing. The programme intends broadly to act as a bridge between young players starting their career and having aspirations of being professional football, receiving their wage and, and working towards achieving their first professional contract. The scheme itself will identify one 17-year-old boy, one 17-year-old girl who receive a bursary as well as their schooling covered in conjunction with going full-time at the professional club that they're registered. They will train full-time in clubs and complete their leaving certificate as part of the initiative. The players supported by Graham Barrett, who's in the room, will work closely with us, the League of Ireland, League of Ireland clubs and the PFAI to identify the correct place and clubs to pilot this initiative with a start date of next season. A working group will be formed, comprised of all the key stakeholders, to work through all of the specific details, identify and partner with League of Ireland clubs and identify the two individuals who will benefit from this exciting opportunity. All of the players that have been involved in this scheme in terms of supporting and driving us to this point have had different journeys to becoming a professional footballer. Most of the players that are back in this initiative have been the beneficiary of full-time training from, from the age of 16 to 19, but not all have had this experience and had, lots have had other challenges to achieve that and being a professional footballer. They want, as a group of players, to ensure that the current 16 to 19 year olds and future generations get the right level of opportunity to being a professional footballer and going on to have pathways beyond playing. Brexit has significantly impacted the development of our young Irish high potential players and it is critical to increase the development time, both coaching and game time, throughout the pathway. And it's absolutely critical at these ages of 16 to 19. The pathways plan will look to address this over the medium to long term, but at this point it is vital to support the players of those ages now and this scheme initiative provides a great opportunity to do that. Football has changed exponentially over the last 20 10 to 20 years, the success of the domestic game in each country and the, the success of the international teams has a direct correlation with the quality of a development system in any country. Whilst the Pathways Plan will address that over a medium to long term, this initiative is an excellent step forwards and we're excited to see the impact it might have. So in summary, we're here working together with, in partnership with key stakeholders across the game, which is a really positive step forwards for the development of Irish football. We thank the players and Graham for their initiative and their innovation. We're excited to launch this initiative in 2024. It's a great example of the types of structures that we want to create as part of the Football Pathways Plan. Integrating football and education and aligning the football and academic pathways is absolutely critical to the success of Irish player development moving forwards. So thank you for your attention. Gavin and Anya and I are happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Can we start with Alex, please, in the live section? Uh, oh, yeah, Gavin, I'm just wondering what does this scholarship idea mean to you, or what, uh, what, 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 uh, what do you think it can achieve? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, something I'm very passionate about, and I think it's uh, 
something that all of the players who have been involved, like Mark mentions, you know, myself, James, Seamus, and uh, and a lot of other players, um, a lot of us with League of Ireland backgrounds are very passionate about giving back to the league. And you know that that fund was set up during COVID to to help the League of Ireland clubs if they got into any financial difficulty and uh, not a lot of it was used and there was a lot remaining so I think our our feeling was how, how can we give back, how can we support and uh, Graham had a, a brilliant initiative to, to start a scholarship programme and there was a lot of time working on it um, and between Mark and Graham we found a, a really good way that we can bring this initiative uh, out to help one 17 year old boy and one 17 year old girl uh, learn to be scholars and learn what a full time scholarship is and how to be involved in football while also having the full backing of their education. As someone who came through the um, League of Ireland system, where do you think it, it, the development needs to, where are the areas that it really needs to improve? Or where, what, what, what are the drawbacks compared to what you would find in an English club? Yeah, I think from my experience, obviously, having both Shamrock Rovers and Manchester City as part of my development pathways to see you know how things are done at Manchester City, which is obviously one of the the top clubs in the world, and to see where where they are at, we have a we have a long way to go, but this is definitely a, a great step to make to to work towards being, you know, an elite nation for developing players from a young age. Uh, oh yeah, how, how does it feel to have the uh, women's side been involved in this, or how do you, how do you think it'll 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 help, or why did you get involved in it? Yeah, I think it's massive and obviously a lot of credit to Gavin and the lads for putting the money back into the game and the FAI and PFAI for, for working together along with Graham and this initiative and I think look, looking back if, if you're a 17, if I was a 17 year old girl this would be a great opportunity to obviously get your education and prepare to, to be a professional footballer and get the resources um, that you need to be to be the best best player you can be and obviously have the back of your education which is is crucial and, and we know that as well so um, yeah look I think it's um, fantastic and obviously to piggyback and assess the Women's World Cup to, to keep that elitism in the game and, and just keep growing and developing our players. The pathway in the women's game seems to be working quite well at the moment with the amount of players coming through the, the league and um, the Piedmont this year I mean how, how things seem to be going really well on that front at the minute. Yeah obviously we've got the, the women's uh, League of Ireland and the under 17 and under 19 league and I think some clubs are still putting their structures in place and players are exposed to, to better training and better coaching and, and better environments but there's still um, a big gap to bridge in that regard and I think um, something like this scholarship to obviously the all around athletes and the player with regards to access to full time training and the mental uh, sports psychology side of the game and their strength and conditioning um, and the the best resource are available to them is key. I just finished by asking Gavin, uh, how do you reflect on the recent international window? Yeah, obviously it was a it was a good result for us last night. It was important that we we went out and made sure we did a professional job and we we performed really well. So I think it was disappointing from the first game, but um, we showed really really good uh, quality last night to get the results. And going forward, do you think the would you be happy to see the current regime stay in place? Uh, for us, I think as a as a group, we're all united in that we're we're very happy um, in the people we have around us, and we've just got to find it within ourselves to to continue to up our performances and get more results. Thank you very much, guys. Is that the last section completed. We'll move into the embargoed section now. So I think from this point onwards, it's 11 p.m. tonight. Dan, do you want to get started in the embargoed? Yeah, Mark. Just on some of the details of this, like what's the uh What's the, I know there was a 30 grand figure mentioned that was raised previously and was most of it left over. What's the value of one of these scholarships, if you know what I mean? Like how much the sort of, I guess what I'm trying to figure out, like, when did they roll this out over to a greater number of people, what would the cost be? I guess what I'm saying. Can I manage it? I think over the next five years, we would like to create a version of this in every League of Ireland club, both for boys and girls, over a period of time. So that that's kind of our ultimate goal to make sure that there is full time opportunities for young, high potential boys and girls in every League of Ireland club in the country. And that's our that's our aim to try to achieve that. But this is a massive step forwards, a positive step forwards. It's it's small in, in terms of its scale, it's only two individuals to start with. But we want to create that, you know, for ten boys, ten girls in every League of Ireland club over the next the next five years and obviously we need investment to do that and there's opportunities to do that through 
our own investment for things that we're currently doing that we might have to stop to make this happen. So obviously looking to speak to government about how they might support that and also seeking new investment from other football bodies and other other areas to try to make sure that happens. But it's, it's absolutely critical that we need to create these full-time football and education programmes for particularly these age groups, 16 to 19 year olds. In terms of the exact numbers, then that's the detail that we're working through over the next period of time to work out how we scale it. But we want to use this as a bit of a test case, for want of a better expression, a case study to say this, 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 this works, this doesn't work, and, and then look to present that to different stakeholders to try to seek new investment to make sure we can get that opportunity for every young boy or girl with dreams to be a professional footballer that lives in different parts of the country. Okay, is it around like 15,000 per student? If that's the type of cost you're looking at to, to, to cover? Well, it's two people. individuals split yeah. across 30 grand, so, right, so you do the maths. Yeah, it's mean, <laughs> essentially there's some money left over from that 30 grand, but it wasn't really tapped into at all. So. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That, that's the plan, obviously. The, the detail needs to be worked for exactly what that looks like. That's around the value of it, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, are they actually putting any money into this then? This is purely the money that's been raised by the players previously. Yeah, at this point it's, it's a players fund, but we, we're working in partnership with that and we will look to support that both in terms of the resources that's needed to make it happen and operationalise it and, and we'll look over the next year in terms of how we can invest in that as well and support that. At this point it's the players fund and they're the ones who've shown the initiative to, to do that and come to us and we've been really supportive of Gavin, Graham and other players and we will look to increase the investment into that over the next period of time. Yeah. So how many, would, in five years' time, would you like to have a plan that's realistic, that's a realistic number? A scholarship in every single league one. So for, for a team, that's a, for, or just for one individual? Every, no, one? no, for a team of players. Yeah, so, you know, if you think, it's easy, the easiest, most common comparison, if you look at the UK, so you finish school at 16, if you're a talented young footballer on the boys' side at the moment, you'll go into a programme, if you demonstrate good potential as a footballer, you can have a two, three year apprenticeship, two, three year scholarship, where you're training every day to be a professional footballer, but you're going for an education programme as part of that. One, because it's the right thing to do holistically for the person and this player, but two, to support pathways beyond playing. So when, when people do finish playing for whatever reason, they have an education pathway to go to. So the exact numbers that to be worked through, listen, it wouldn't just be one scholarship for every club. It would yeah. be the core basis of that under-17 or under-19 team that, that's in the league minor club. So this is a one-year pilot scheme? At the moment, yeah, this is a one-year pilot. So is, from the FBI point of view, is the pressure on for year two, because when you're talking about doing this in five years, you're going to have to come up with more quickly somehow, from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, well, we know that. I understand what you're asking about. Yeah, we're asking about investment, and, we're, and when we come back to present the football pathways plan, we can talk in more detail about how we plan to finance all the things we want to do over the next ten years, actually. But we'll deliver our vision for football pathways plans over a two-year cycle. So we will present that in more detail what that looks like. Gavin, when you went to Ashley and the before you went away, is there experience you've had there that you know what works or what can't work? That can help the next yeah, exactly. I think that was um, a really key part of me wanting to be involved in this, being able to have gone through something similar in terms of being able to, to go to Ashfield College and to be able to train from such a young age with the Shamrock Rovers first team. I know how much of a, a head start I felt that gave me as a, as a young professional footballer to be able to train with the likes of you know Joey O'Brien, Roberto Lopez, Ronan Finn, to be able to expose myself to those professionals at the age of 14 and 15 and to really learn what it was like to be a professional footballer at such a young age for me like my day was always going into training and going to school at two o'clock finishing at seven half past seven in the evening and for me that gave me a real understanding of what it was to be a professional footballer and I think that's what we're trying to recreate here we're trying to give two two people one one young boy and one young girl a chance to to have that same understanding and that same opportunity to become a scholar and to learn what it can be to be a professional footballer we're also backing them to have a full education. I'm pretty sure I know the answer is but realistically would you have had the career you've had today without being able to do that at 
No, not at all. I think the the exposure I got to, to first team training at such a, such a young age and to to have my education as a backing was a was a definite boost in my career at that stage. Yeah, like, you know, Gavin, like, unfortunately, you're one of the one of the lucky ones. Like, where the reason we're asking questions, obviously, about uh, the cost of it, is because we know that football in this country isn't particularly wealthy. You know, there's an ongoing debate about trying to get funding. Like, does it frustrate you that the sport you play? And with such great participation rates and such great sort of benefits is in this position that unfortunately no, this is a good scheme but we're sort of wondering where is the finance for it going to come from? Yeah of course it's disappointing but you know from for me as a player I'm looking what do I do to benefit the game and for me and for the other group of players that's been mentioned myself and and James has spoke a lot about this and we think you know what can we do to give back to the game that we love so much especially in the League of Ireland you know we're both big fans of, of different clubs in the League of Ireland we watch all of the games and you know all we can do from this point of view is to support as well as we can with both our status and you know with being able to provide this fund and all we can do is put that forward and hope that other people are willing to support you know over the last week I've been speaking to other players within the group and I've had just positive news from six seven eight different players who've said they'd all be willing to back it as well so I think if we come out and show a united front you know for me to be able to sit beside mark and and do this and show support to the fai is is massive and i think we're just looking for other people to come out and support us does it frustrate you gavin at all that another sport basically rugby gets a lot of benefactors from business to we, we put a lot of money into these sort of schemes at Leicester and most in particular in terms of funding partly funding some players wages is that something that, rather than say it doesn't frustrate you, is that something you would like to be brought into to this scheme? Because this is clearly a really worthy scheme, but it's going to cost money and it's going to need support. Yeah, I think for us, like I mentioned, I think my main aim here is to, to put this in place, mm. show that it can work, and then to be able to prove to people that it's worthy enough uh, for that backing, and if we can prove that this works well enough to deserve the backing, then hopefully we'll get it. Government, Mark, I presume that has to be a, a place that you're going to have to lobby if you're going to expand the way you're, you're hoping to. Is that, is that within your, your short term plans, your medium term plans? All, all of the above. Um, okay. Wait, can you tell us a bit more? Then? So, before I answer that specifically, like we're trying to look at this uh, kind of over a medium to long term as well. Yeah. So we want to integrate football and education at every level of the pathway. So that's primary, secondary, and third level education. We think that's absolutely fundamental to the development of children, the opportunities to provide children with multi-sport at the youngest ages, and we think it's a massive benefit to player development as well in terms of having that holistic development of football and education combined and aligning those pathways. And that that it will be a key guiding principle of the pathways plan which we'll launch later in the year. We want to increase development time from a, from a younger age and that's coaching and game time. So like your question, someone's question to Gavin about would you be in the same place? Well, we do need to increase the coaching hours and the quality of the coaching and the game time from a young age to, to, to achieve the level which Gavin and on you have for the future because football is change, changed and changing moving forwards and we want to diversify the development experience as well that young players have from the young stages all the way through to making their debut in the League of Ireland or, or other ex experiences. So that's kind of our starting point and we want to produce more and better Irish developed players that supplies our domestic game but also our international team. So that's what, that's what broadly what we're, broadly what we're trying to achieve. And then another key principle is that how do we maximise our structural advantages? It's like, what is unique about Ireland? What's different about what's in Ireland compared to other countries? And try to, so if, that, if that's our vision, how do we utilise those, those structures? So I think there are already structures that are in place across the education sector in terms of the transition year, which is not normal mm -hmm. in many other countries. We have an ETB, Education Training Board programme, that we could potentially utilise as part of this, which is in our thinking. So although it is about seeking new investment, there are already structural advantages that we've already got in this country that we could maybe think about using differently in the future to help us achieve what I said at the start about developing Irish players, increasing contact time, diversifying the experiences that young players have, 
integrating football and education. That's absolutely key to that. So I think that's that's probably two points. And then specifically to your question, we're talking to government about lots of things at the moment, about supporting our facilities investment strategy. We're talking to them about increasing investment into our academies and increasing the level of grants to help provide more resources to increase staffing levels in academies because we know that's absolutely key and we'll also be talking to them about these, this initiative moving forward as well and how they might support that both through new investment but also through the different structures that I've already outlined that we could be utilising and in, in enhancing what we do with existing structures. If you're talking to a government about a lot of things, as you've, as you've said there, I know it's not necessarily always used on these discussions, but is it difficult within that to like distill down what's the real important short-term priorities? Like there's a 15-year element, which is only a 10-year, but as you know, there'll be people out there in the game screaming they need stuff to happen now, you know, in terms of like prioritising things. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I've no, as you know, I've been in the role for a year. Now, my, my brief in the first year was to review football structures, both adult and children's youth aged players. And I don't want to keep coming back to football pathways plan, but as we launch that, that will be key, where we say that this is our 10 year vision, we're going to deliver in two year cycles, these are things we're going to focus on in the first two years of what we're trying to do. It will be about pathways for everyone, boys, girls, men, women. It will be about players, coaches, match officials, administrators, the whole suite of people. But there'll be an absolute razor sharp focus on the development of players. And that'll be absolutely key to what we're trying to achieve. And as I've said in the last time that we spoke in this environment, we're going to have to stop doing some of the stuff we do currently to help achieve that. We are going to get new investment. We'll seek new investment from different ways, UEFA, FIFA, government, private investment possibly, some people who might be interested in Irish football. And then also it's about stopping some things we're currently doing and repurposing that for different reasons. So th and that, that is absolutely will be the biggest focus of the Football Pathways Plan will be around player development, player pathways. Just coming from like, the football background that you've come from, it's kind of unusual is it, that if the impetus for this has to come from current players. It's highly totally unusual. You couldn't envisage a scenario in other countries maybe where this would have to happen. You know, for players to come forward and maybe try and use their status as a sort of answer to make the case but it seems like the battle to, to make that case yeah, I haven't really experienced that so far I'm only in a year so I'm just keeping my head up and not getting stuck in the, the challenges you know I'm not naive I know there's going to be barriers to what we're trying to do I, I'm not saying you're saying this but I see this as a huge positive that we've got players who are, care about the game who, who've, who are passionate about Ireland, Irish football, passionate about the League of Ireland, the domestic game as well as the international. So I only see this as actually uh, purely as a positive. Whether that's happened in other countries or not, then okay. But I think this is just a huge positive and the more stakeholders that we can unite and partner with each other, not just the players but the different affiliates, the different associations and working cl more closely with the PFAI, that is all, that is all part of the a thriving football development system that we should be trying to trying to achieve. So I just I would just see it as a as a positive rather than thinking, well, if it hasn't happened somewhere else, that so that's a negative. Five minutes left, guys. Okay, John's got to last. Mark, how, how challenging is it to get football into schools? You talk about this obviously you know that certain schools play certain sports. You can get football in for the biggest sea change to the last schools, etc. So you know. Yeah, we want to try and grow football and develop football and pathways in every part of the country. Absolutely, everyone. And we've been through a big consultation, going out and learning about different challenges nationally, but also in the regions and different local areas. And it's clear to see that there's pockets of the country which is really super focused on football, and there's other parts of the country that are not for, for different, different reasons. I think it's a massive opportunity for us to embed football into schools from the youngest ages. I think, particularly in primary school, having a multi-sport curriculum where you're exposing children to physical literacy, fundamental movement skills, but using those different sports to achieve that, it was absolutely key to, one, physical activity for young people and children, but also just creating that early engagement with football and embedding that into a young person's you know, early childhood and life. To your specific question, I understand that will be a challenge because there's some parts of the country that are not as kind of football focused as we might be sat here. 
but we believe that over the next five years that will be something that is key to try to engage children in football at the earliest and youngest ages and we think schools is a massive opportunity to do that. Yeah. You just for the women's game, bringing in, like, giving one girl next year a chance to go full time, will this mean more of a change in the women's game as well? Like, I, mean, I know it's not that long going on for Ben Subs and there's some semi pros, but does this need a fully professional league? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something we should always be striving for. Obviously, the league only received its professional status last season, and um, Shamrock Rovers are leading the way in that regard, and we're still only part-time to so to expose and a lot of them young players that 17 year olds will be involved in our squad at the moment so to be able to give them access to, to full-time training while trying to balance their education and um, will be massive help obviously for them to go on and whether they go abroad or but ultimately for for international team and our domestic league here. Is it even more pressing on your side again in some ways that even the players are very successful in the international team they're unlikely to make the money that they can retire off, you know what I mean? The salaries are comparatively lower, so they do need it, right? You oh, absolutely. Like, I think players' education and having that to fall back on um, when they finish playing football or whether they're it's not as successful through injury or whatever, and it's similar in the, in the men's game as well, that they can balance and, and juggle to be the best football player they can and obviously to strive to, to live them dreams of, of playing professional football whilst obviously having their education to fall back on. and. That as well in the women's game might even extend beyond their leaving cert and, and into third level as well if they can balance it. On your question, Dan, um, I think there's a there's there's an impetus and motivation to do this across the boys and girls, and as you'll know, the the game is at different stages of maturation. So obviously, the the boys and men's game has been further developed over years and years. The women and girls game is growing hugely across the globe and and in this and this country. I think the. The girls' pathways across different countries are at a more of a similar stage. So there's some some countries that might be further ahead, but I think this is a massive opportunity to kind of supercharge and accelerate that development of players and supercharge the development of our international teams. I think from the boys' side, the game has changed exponentially over the last 20 years, and there is not a level playing field anymore. Some of the some of the other countries and the academies and when they start and what they provide young players from a young age it's not comparable to what is on the, on the boys and there is a level of, there is partly a degree of catch up on the boys side whereas on the girls side it's a case of can we keep striving and going forwards and accelerate and try and get ahead and that on the boys side we're trying to, a little bit of catch up to then try and strive and accelerate further ahead all, all, all just as important on both sides but both at different stages of maturation in terms of their growth as a game Gavin, can I ask you do you feel if um, this project ex extends to be able to reach uh, Mark's hope in terms of a full-time underage team if the finance is there for that? Do you feel that would make, in time, that would make a difference to the senior international team? Yeah, I'm 100% sure of that because I think if we were to have, if you look at example for the changes now that Brexit makes, um, with young players now not being able to go over to the UK as early. At the moment it's a disadvantage to us because we're having a lot of players who from the ages of 17 are, are stuck in, in a place where they can't be as highly trained as they would if they were to go to elite academies. So I believe that we can make that our advantage. We can keep players here for longer. We can have them play in our first teams in our league. We can strengthen our league and make it more of a competitive league and make sure that the players that are coming through that are more ready to, to move up to other parts of the world if they're ready to, at the ages of 18, 19, 20, and ready to compete to be in our first team earlier. Mark, sorry, what finances league-wide? This initiative itself? Yeah. I think we need to work through the detail of that. So, and we'll we'll have to come back to you again nearer the time when we launch this to go through some fine detail what that looks like. Well, it's, it's not huge money, really. Sure, it's not. Yeah. To, to do this across all the all the clubs. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I've said. So I don't know the exact number yet. We're working through that detail, but I don't think it's all new investment. I think it's using the monies that we've already got. It's using certain structures that are in Ireland already to try yeah. and to try and achieve that. So I don't I genuinely don't think it's unrealistic to try to aim for that over a period of time. Mm -hmm. and we'll is it separate from any academy proposals or is there natural 
so this, over anyway, or this sort of... This would fit in an academy structure. So you, um, from 17 to 19, 16 to 19 is more of kind of your professional development phase is very specific. You're training to be a professional whilst doing your education. So for 12 to 16 is more your kind of youth development. And then from 5 to 11 is more your individual development uh, over a period of time. So th this scholarship structure sits in very firmly in that 16 to 19 age bracket of an academy. So it would sit in an under 17 team or under 19 team for scholars. Because imagine if you had a group of scholars that started next year. Imagine we were five years ahead. And then every year you, you were taking a new cohort of scholars. So you, you're talking, if it was a three-year scholarship, you might have 30 scholars in that, in that age bracket, under 17 to 19. So I think it sits in the academy structure, Dan, but the, the academy proposal that we're speaking with government at the moment is separate but linked. We're looking to try and increase the level of grants that we give clubs to for their op operational costs, staffing costs, etc. But this would sit in a player pathway within an academy. And if that hopefully that makes sense. We'll have to wrap it up there, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Does that much like, so, yeah. On your training, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs>